Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 72 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today I'm speaking with Kimberly Muse. As a young girl, Kim grew up in Panama, where her mother Annie worked as a school teacher for the U.S. Department of Defense, and her father, Kurt Muse, worked as a businessman. But unbeknownst to Kim, her father was also involved with a group of Panamanian activists in protesting against and subverting the government of General Manuel Noriega. Kurt and his friends received support from the CIA for their efforts. Then, in the spring of 1989, Kurt was suddenly arrested at Panama City Airport as he was returning from a trip to the United States. The Muse family's world was upended as he was thrown in jail for the next nine months until he was rescued by Delta Force in Operation Acid Gambit. I invited Kim onto the podcast to hear a firsthand account of what transpired for her family before during and after her father's arrest and eventual rescue in Panama City in 1989. Kurt later wrote a best-selling memoir of his time in Panama called Six Minutes to Freedom. After you finish listening to our discussion, if you want to learn more, you can download a free sample of the book using a link in the show notes of this episode, which has been very generously provided by Kurt himself. But before we get into Kim's story, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Jacob G. and Adam L. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Kim, first of all, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today. Absolutely. I'm honored that you would have me on. Oh my gosh. Well, I know I've been pursuing this interview for a really long time. As you know, I've been pretty persistent. In yes, fact, I'm kind of shocked it's happening because I, I think I reached out to you like a year ago or something now and never quite let up, but it, it paid off in the end. So I know it's going to be worth the wait. So, I, I sure hope it is. Yes, I, I definitely believe it. I know that your father has spoken about this publicly, but have you given very many interviews on this subject yourself? Probably only two, and they were with other military groups. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is a little bit new for you, but I'm very honored yes. that you chose this <laughs> venue to speak up. It, it was your persistence, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't a little bit overboard, but I, I have not to Not at all. Great. Absolutely not at all. Great. I'm glad to hear it. So let, let's go back to Panama, of course, what the whole story is about, really. What was it like for you prior to this kind of you know cataclysmic event, what was life like growing up as an American in Panama near the canal? Absolutely idyllic. And I wouldn't even say that I would classify myself then as an American, although I was considered American because I went to an American school. But really, I was born and raised in Panama and it was my entire life, the only thing that I knew. So I was Panamanian and dual citizenship American at the same time. And I lived in Panama City, so I was not near the canal, and I wasn't on a base or anything like that. So really just more integrated with the, the Panamanians, as oh, was okay. my entire family, actually. I see. I see. Yeah, that does sound very interesting. What was life like for the Panamanians themselves? Was it also kind of an idyllic time, or was it a little bit different for them? Well, gosh, before I would say Noriega, everything was... Everything was okay under the previous dictator. He was a benevolent dictator, Omar Torrijos. You know, everything was copacetic. Like we would go to the beach, we would hang out, go to the union club. I mean, I had a wonderful family life at home. Like I had great neighbors and friends. And all of that did start changing, I would say, in the late 80s at the rise of uh, Manuel Antonio Noriega. Hmm. Okay. And what was your family doing down there in the first place? Was it just your, your mother's job primarily that brought you to Panama and kept you there? No, it was my, my father's job and hmm. his connection 
to, well, obviously his father. They have a family business down there of architectural supplies, printing and graphic supplies, actual machines for printing. So it was a family business that I think my grandfather had actually started up in probably about the 50s when my grandfather moved his family, including my dad, to Panama. Oh, okay. And so he had a very deep roots there in Panama. Your whole family did. Extremely deep roots. So my dad was there since he was a baby, you know, so he really identified with Panama as being his home as well as, you know, as well as mine, because he was pretty much not born there, but he was raised there and went to actually the Panamanian through the Panamanian school system. Whereas my mom moved there when she was about 14 years old, uh, because interestingly enough, her, her dad, my grandfather on my on my mom's side was actually CIA. (laughs) So yes, quite, quite a few connections to Panama. And so my parents happened to meet at at American high school and married soon after college and had me Hmm. in Panama. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you lived your entire life in Panama then up to entire life born and raised. So I knew, I knew no other life except for what I had in Panama. And that drastically changed one night in 1989 when I had to you know, evacuate and come to the States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine that was a shock. We'll get and, to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. I mean, exactly like you were saying. So since you mentioned that things started to go wrong with the rise of Noriega, I'm sure that not everyone listening is nearly as familiar with those, you know, regional politics basically as you are. So can you talk just a little bit about Noriega, like how he came to power, what he did to the country once he was in power, that sort of thing? He, yes, absolutely. So brief synopsis, there was General Manuel Noriega who actually It is presumed that he offed the previous dictator, Omar Torrijos, in a very suspicious airplane crash. Once he came into power, he, you know, pretty much was the general of the military and had the entire military forces behind him. And he himself was a huge narcotraficante, which is a trafficker of drugs, pretty much. And so he worked highly a lot with the Colombians, bringing in drugs. He also squashed freedom of pretty much freedom of press. There was no freedom of press. It was all at that point then put under government mandates and there was no freedom of assembly so that we couldn't protest the things that he was doing to the country, which was slowly killing it economically, politically, and even physically killing people that he just didn't like, which happened to be a lot of my dad's friends who were you know, politically active in the rotary groups. And it just became a really heavy an unsafe environment. Everybody was worried about the secret police, which they would call the the Hedos and the Dobermans, which were the extremely aggressive military special ops people. And there were several other types of military operational people that I don't remember their exact names, but they were special forces that were out there really designed to intimidate the fellow Panamanians, unfortunately. Oh, wow. So yeah. I know that the, the year we're focusing on is 1989, but when did he rise to power and how quickly did things start to go bad after that point? Oh gosh, Justin, you know what? I do not exactly know, but gosh, I think it was at least two years prior when I just remember my dad starting to get uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, okay. One of his businesses was actually blown up. It was a printing shop. And one of his businesses was blown up because apparently he was printing, it wasn't seditious papers, but it was papers telling the people, you know, to go out and vote and to be anti-drug and that sort of thing. And, you know, that put my dad's door on the radar and it was blown up, literally blown up. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. (laughs) Well, to to your knowledge at that time, was he simply like fulfilling orders from customers or was that something that he wanted to be printing himself or for his friends? My dad is so idealistic and he saw his, the, not his country of birth, obviously, because he's American, but his country that he, he really felt is his home being sucked of its life. I, hmm. it, people were just afraid to move. People were afraid to, to speak their mind for fear of getting turned in. He wanted to do this. It, my dad doesn't do anything unless it's willfully done. Oh, and wow. he's very principled and he, it was soon thereafter, I think he started establishing certain friendships within his rotary group of very like-minded individuals. 
that started Radio La Voz de la Libertad, okay. which was his underground radio station. I see. And at this time, you were, what, like 14, 15 years old when, when everything really started to happen? Is that about right? Yes, sir. I was probably about 14. And when it all, excuse my French, but when that shit hit the fan, I was 15, almost 16. Okay. So was he shielding you and the family from a lot of this knowledge prior to everything happening? Or were you somewhat aware of, you know, big things happening around your family at that time? <laughs> it's funny that you ask. So I was, as a 15 year old, highly involved in the politics, you know, very proactive. I would go to protests without my dad knowing. Oh, wow. Yeah. With my, with one of my cousins. So we would go wear all white and start banging pots and pans, like marching and protesting in the street. And we did that several times without my dad knowing. He later found out that I did that and he pretty much forbade me to go. And at that point it was actually escalating in violence against the participants anyway. So he, he knew what was going on and he didn't tell me that, to, to start off some of his activities because I don't think in his mind he actually knew what this was going to grow into. And I knew he was like-minded as well, obviously, as myself, you know, really contra or against Noriega. However, he did shield us. He shielded myself and he shielded my brother. But of course, my mom and my dad are an amazing power couple and they shared everything with each other. So my mom knew everything. And oh. my brother and I were kind of kept in the dark, but holy moly, I was not an idiot. And I definitely saw lots of signs of things that were definitely not normal in a household. <laughs> okay. I see. Was your mom like totally on board with this or, I mean, you know, did she anticipate the level of danger that, you know, this would eventually bring to the family or could she have anticipated that? Oh, God. Or could he, as a matter of fact? You know what? They're so idealistic. I don't think really they thought at initially that it could get to be something dangerous, especially like in the earlier months and the earlier times. But honestly, as it did start escalating, they 1000% knew what was going to happen and how dangerous it was. And mm. at that point, I also felt extreme anxiety from both my parents. And now I, I mean, I know obviously in retrospect that I can attribute it to my dad's his his other job. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So yeah. on on that note, you mentioned Radio Libertad a minute ago. Is that that was his his clandestine project there? Yes, yes. So that was one of the the outward things that you could see of, of what he did. So it's called Radio La Voz de la Libertad. So it's Radio Voice of Liberty, and obviously he started this because there was no freedom of press and he and it was right before an, an election so his impetus was the elections and getting out you know getting the people out to vote letting them know that their country needs them letting them know to have faith in god and their country that that you know together we can do this so really it it was it, it came from a place of him wanting to do well for his country and, and seeing his country liberated of this horrible dictator and encouraging people so to, to vote and to stand together unified. That's how it started. <laughs> and then it ended up growing into a much more effective clandestine group that was able to find out a lot of information on the military tactics and police tactics that was, you know, military police of Noriega through their scanners and other equipment that they had. Wow. Wow. Okay. So this, this just, uh, blossomed. Expanded. Yeah. Yeah. Blossom. <laughs> exactly. That's, yes. the, that's a perfect word for it. So it blossomed beyond expectations is what I'm hearing. Kind of. Yes. Was he the head of this or was he a senior person within this, you know, kind of loose organization or, or what exactly? You know, that's really hard to say. I would, Yes, I think he was the head of it, but he would never say that, to be honest with you, because he works arm in arm with everybody and everybody had their own spe specifics that they brought to the group. And I'm thinking specifically about another guy of, who I know very well, who was a friend of, of the family, who was also in Rotary, who happened to also be on the plane with my dad as he was coming back from Miami when he was captured. But that's, that comes later. But he was the, the communications tech guy because he worked at the communications firm. 
so he was our, our engineer for, for lack of a better word, the engineer of the communication systems that my dad and his group had. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Was, what was it that your father brought to this that, that made it so successful? Was it his organizational skills or was it, you know, funding (laughs) or, you know, a combination of multiple things? I think it was a combination of multiple things. Aside from extreme personal interest, he's very dedicated and very p- focused and passionate when it comes to, you know, morality of things and the principle of things. And this is something that he wanted to do and he wanted to take care of when he tr- really wanted to truly help Panama. Like what was the, the skills that he brought? Like as an example, okay, did he yeah. have any experience with radio broadcasts, for example, or did he just have the will to make it all happen? Okay, that's where I was going. Yes, he had the will to make it all happen. I think that's it. His drives and his dedication was that. And he just put in, as I think about it now in retrospect, so, so many hours sitting and listening to the scanner and radio communications between military people and the police people and eventually figuring out their codes and breaking codes. And that information was extremely useful to the CIA. Wow. Um, okay. And so he, through somebody who he thought was a secretary of the CIA, who actually ended up being, I guess, more of an operator for the CIA, mm-hmm. which we didn't know at the time. He's like, listen, I have all this information. Can you tell your boss, which actually was her, mm. that I have this information that may be of value. And they were literally just friends from soccer. So that's how we, you know, we, there were kids in their family, kids in our family. And so we played soccer with their kids. So it was truly an innocent connection that did, again, also blossom into something else. I see. Yeah. So I think because of that, my dad was probably more the spearhead of the operation. And amongst themselves, they all figured out these codes and they all, they all had scanners and they were all highly involved in, in certain things to, <laughs> to actually mess with the, the military and to mess with Noriega, hmm. which was the fun part. Wow. Okay. So initially, at least before he reached out to the friend that you mentioned from, from yes. soccer, this was entirely grassroots. Is that correct? This was his effort. This oh. was Panamanian's effort. This was not directed or influenced by the CIA to begin with. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Yes. And I should have clarified that from the beginning because that is extremely important that your listeners know that this was a 100% grassroots effort, which is what I think made it so powerful because they're actual literal Panamanians on this group that were wanting their country to be free of this dictator. So they were motivated by that love for their country. And it was definitely not just a job for the CIA. In fact, it was the CIA who was extremely rely, relied on my dad and his group for their information. The CIA, at that point, the grounds people didn't have that much information. And I think their job was really easy at that point for them because they see Noriega technically was working with them, <laughs> ironically. And so their job was kind of easy. It was kind of made for them. Like they got their information from Noriega or from his people. But of course, that's tainted knowledge, tainted information. And what my dad would bring to them was new, real, hard data and cracking codes that they were able to share with the CIA. Okay. Okay. I've got it. And I'm glad that you said that because that brings up a point I meant to hit a few minutes ago, but that is that Noriega was an ally of the U.S. for a (laughs) number of years and more than an ally. He was essentially a, a paid I don't know if I'd say employee, but a paid asset in, in so many ways has been reported quite a bit. Yes. So can you can you describe that a little bit? Like how did that start and how did it go wrong eventually? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I that was under the Reagan administration where Noriega was was an informant to the CIA and I think was technically on their payroll. And so it made the job of the people that were in the CIA there. I think it made them complacent. So they didn't really have to dig for data. But things started turning when they realized that this man was actually not a benevolent dictator like Omar Torrijos was, but actually a really, really bad guy who was out torturing people. So needless to say, once President Bush came in, the entire directive changed, especially since President Bush Sr. was previously in the CIA. And so I think he understood more of what was going on and what was happening 
And at that point, my dad started, he had been in contact with the CIA before under the, the Reagan administration time period. And then because he felt he wasn't being his data or himself, his identity wasn't being, I think, safe. Like there wasn't enough safety precautions on the CIA there. They were a little bit lackadaisical in that part. He felt he needed to sever ties with them or at least communications with them. But that that started back up again once President Bush came into power. Okay. Well, came into the presidency. Yeah. Sometimes our our foreign policy can change <laughs> yeah. very quickly, yes. much more quickly it than did. the rest of the world is prepared to to deal with. Uh, exactly. Well, that makes sense. But you know, he was in for a while and then he was out. And exactly. Your family was caught in the middle of all of that, obviously. So your father was running this network, but how quickly did that attract the wrong kind of attention from the Panamanian government at that time? How, how quickly did they learn that, you know, this Ooh. operation was going on right under their noses? Oh my goodness. It was, it, my dad and his group was known to be public enemy number one to Noriega. He'd talked about it and he had actually Cubans communist Cubans looking for him and trying to triangulate the radio stations, where the, where it was coming from. And it got really hot and heated for quite a long time until he was actually caught. And I just do want to back up a little bit and say that the CIA once, once at at any time when my dad was involved with them, my dad never received money from them for himself or any of his people. It was 100% money to go to the rent of the buildings that they had to rent, or not the buildings, but the apartments within different buildings that they had to rent in order to move their radio, their radio equipment from time to time because they didn't want the Cubans to triangulate their signal. And interesting enough, there was one time that there was like twin towers. And for instance, they were in like apartment 14B in the tower one. And they saw... In Tower 2, Apartment 14B, being broken into by the military police who were trying to find them. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yes. It was one of the bad days, I'm sure, when my dad came home and was stressed out as hell. (laughs) Wow. So there were many, many close calls like that. But my dad's group was so meticulous and so good and so on top of it and so worried about being caught, especially towards the end when everything started getting so much more violent. It was it was really really a scary a time for people that were anti Noriega. I, I can imagine. Did he consider quitting at any point that you're aware of? Like, did the the, the heat just get too hot? You know, at, <laughs> obviously not. But I mean, did he come close to quitting anyway? No, 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 definitely not. No, my dad is extremely persistent and passionate about <laughs> things like this. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not. I think it actually probably fortified him to be more diligent, more secure security conscious, more this, more that to get the job done. He even started ramping up pretty like messing with the military, like giving false orders and messing with communications, like demoralizing them, calling them like names. And then like, so that was just some stuff they were doing. And then later there was like a big, like a state of the union, for lack of a better term, that Noriega was going to be giving on all of the broadcast radio stations and TV stations. My dad's group interrupted it as it was about to start. So it goes like introducing, of course, in Spanish, General Antonio Manuel Noriega. And then, psh, you know, everybody's like clapping. Whoa, and then, psh, and then Radio La Voz de la Libertad, like literally breaks into the, the transmission of Noriega and Oh my gosh, like after that point, the shit hit the fan. Like he, they were trying to find him like so hard and the pressure was on and it made them stronger and more tactical in in how they moved around. But it was, it was, everybody was getting more and more scared and everybody had a, you know, a bug out bag that they had packed just in case they needed to escape, which ultimately they did have to. It was serious times. (laughs) Can you talk a little bit about their their operations? Like, were they making broadcasts once a week or every day, you know, like clockwork or, or what? I mean, how did they stay ahead of these people trying to catch them exactly? I mean, you said they moved around a lot, but how, how frequently did that have to happen? They did move around quite a bit. 
And I think in the beginning, they probably were able to be a little bit more complacent because the heat wasn't on them as much. But then once Nordiega realized that these people were, you know, my dad's group was against them and he realized that he needed to go find them, you know, things started heating up. But they they kept on doing this and they kept on keeping on because they, they had to. Hmm. Wow. That's some grit there. For it, sure. it, it is some grit. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, <laughs> but <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, it sounds like things ramped up. Well, how quickly did all of this kind of come to a head? Was this a period of weeks or months or over a year? It's super hard to say, Justin, because I wasn't involved in the day-to-day operations, obviously, or any of the operations. I, I wasn't aware of it, but I do know that the broadcast did not come out super consistently it was because there were six or seven guys in my dad's group. And so it was based on their schedules and families and, and horrible rush hour traffic in Panama mm. and how they were going to meet. There were so many logistics. I would say at a minimum, there was probably a broadcast once a week. At times, there were probably more. And just to give you a little more background information, actually, the broadcasts were not done by the people in my dad's group. They wanted the, the, the broadcast to sound extremely professional. So what they did was they contracted somebody that, that they knew was like, like-minded with them and who was a radio announcer, like a, a famous voice of Panama. And they contracted him to make these recordings and they would, from there, take those recordings and then set them off remotely in different, in different areas. So that they weren't actually physically there when the broadcasts were going off. So again, that was a, a way to keep them safe. Sure, smart. But that said, unfortunately, the person who was doing the radio broadcast for us had a wife who was, let's just say she was a gambler and was extremely in debt And so she didn't know what she had and she didn't know what her husband doing or what my dad did. But all she knew was that her husband was making broadcasting seditious materials for my dad. And that's all she knew. So she took that information to some military person who paid her some, who paid the money to get her out of debt from this gambling situation that she had. And that ultimately is how my dad was caught. And they didn't even know actually who they had until they started interrogating him days later. My gosh. Yeah. (laughs) So she not only sold out your father, but she sold out her own husband as well. I mean, did she name him as a, you know, a co-conspirator or did she try to keep her own husband out of it to your knowledge? I, I think she actually tried to keep her own husband out of it, which is super ironic. It doesn't make any sense, but I guess she just needed the money. So, you know, oh I gosh. guess nothing makes sense at that, at that point. But yeah, she sold out her fellow Panamanians for cash. Wow. Man, that's yeah. horrible. That horrible human. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no doubt about it. So you mentioned that your father's arrest, of course. And can you, can you walk us through how that happened exactly? Absolutely. So my dad was away on a trip to Miami to, I think, actually pick up some equipment that he had bought. So he had to get like a, he had to forge documentation once he was in the States to say that he was a, you know, like a fisherman and he needed like certain radio equipment so he could bring it back into Panama so that the Panamanian authorities wouldn't think of anything of it. So he had a whole cover set up that he had been using, I think, for the last two years and trying to get radio equipment into Panama. But it just so happened that this time when he was coming in with another friend of his who was in the group, who was a Panamanian, but who was thankfully sitting at a different seat because, of course, they would never sit together. They didn't even talk to each other. I mean, they took so many precautions. And, and, you know, of course, they're not CIA trained. They're not spy trained. But ultimately, actually, my dad has given talks for the CIA, and they have told him that he did everything just organically on his own, the correct way. And so it, it's really cool validation for him to hear that. But anyway, back to the story. So he's flying in and from him, his perspective, he comes in, lands at like 8 p.m. He comes up to the glass window of the aduanas or the, the immigration and it says, he sees it taped to the glass window and he sees it from behind, American 
citizen Kurt Muse arrest on site. And it's a picture of his passport. Oh my God. So obviously he was like, Oh shit. So there was nothing he could do. He presented his passport and they, they took him in a back room. And so on my end, what happened? And so he, in his mind is worried about his friend though, by the way, because he doesn't know what information these people have, which thank God it didn't include information on anybody else in the group, which was literally a godsend because if it had been any other Panamanians, they honestly would have been killed. But because my dad was protected under the U.S. treaty because of my mom's role as in the Department of Defense dependent schools, he was actually protected under the treaty, hmm. Hmm. which is which is very, very important. <laughs> Otherwise, he I mean, he could have just been left for dead as well. But if, if Noriega had done anything to him, it would have jeopardized the treaty of the Panama Canal. So clearly he didn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, so on my perspective, I'm sitting at home waiting for him. I knew he was going to get home at like 8 p.m. It's like 9, it's 10, it's 11. A friend of his dad calls and is, he's like, where is your dad there? And it was the friend who was on the airplane with him. And I said, actually, no, he's not home yet. And so he hung up the phone. He's like, okay, thank you. Not 30 minutes later, I hear a bunch of like cars going around in my, like I live in a dead end street and I hear a bunch of cars just idling. So I go up to my balcony and I look down discreetly and I'm like, oh shit. I see four giants and they, they, they're vans, but like blacked out and like jacked up. They're, they're known for being the military secret police vehicles. And so I was like, oh, this is definitely not good. And my dad happens to be walking out with two guys on either side. And he looks up to the balcony. I think he sensed me looking at him. And he says, Kimberly, some of my friends need to look at the house. And I go, oh, damn. Okay. I come down. But first, I'm thinking in my mind, our house was like an arsenal. <laughs> like I knew where every gun was hidden. And, and obviously, I grew up learning how to shoot when I was a little girl, you know, at my grandfather's farm. So I knew how to handle a weapon and I knew exactly where they were. But I saw that there were way too many people and there were just too many vehicles with an undisclosed amount of people. So I'm like, there's no way I should get a gun and go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, let's, let's think about this. So I go to the door, I answer the door. And he, my dad brings me close into him. He's like, okay, these people really need to come look at the house and search around. And I'm like, okay, all right. And he's, I really want you to stay with me. And so I stayed with him for a little bit. And so they're touring around the house. They look into my room. It is filled with seditious drawings that I have made. You know, I'm, you know, 14, 15 years old. I'm like making drawings about Cara de Piña, which was like a nickname for Noriega, like a, a pineapple face because he had a horrible oh, park yeah. marks. Yeah. And like, viva la sedición, like all this stuff against Noriega. And so all the, the, the police were, or the military guys were like, oh, so this is the bullshit you're teaching your daughter. Oh, my god! And I, I was like, oh, God, if only I had time to like take all this stuff down before they got in there. And it was just a really, it was surreal this was happening, Justin, because there was one guy who actually literally looked like Noriega, who had a voice that was like a high-pitched witch. But with the juxtaposition of this other guy who looked like a preppy rich boy who was like the colonel. I was like, what is going on? And this other guy is like talking to me about scuba diving because I was a scuba diver. It was a bizarre situation. At some point, I realized, you know what? I need to get the hell out of this situation. So I told my dad, I was like, dad, I really need to leave. He's like, Kimberly, please don't leave. I was like, dad. I need to leave the situation. And so I asked without even looking to my dad again, I was like, listen to this coronel. I'm like, coronel, me tengo que ir. No me necesiten aquí. And so that, oh, so colonel, like, you don't need me here. I'm just going to go down to my friend's house. And remember at this point, they don't know who my dad is. So the colonel inside was like, sure, go ahead. So I was able to sneak into my dad's room somehow unaccompanied. And I got my dad dot matrix printout of his friends. And contact names, contact numbers, et cetera. And I shoved it down the back of my, of my shorts. I'm like, okay, I need these numbers to contact these people. So I start booking it out of my apartment of, of our, of our building or excuse me, of my home. And 
I am chased down by these guys, military dudes with big machine guns. Of course, like in a freaking horror movie, I trip and they haul me up by my arm and I defiantly am like, get your hands off me. Your coronel said that I could leave. They didn't believe me. They hauled me back to the house. They asked the coronel. The coronel said, yes, you can go. And so I was like, ah, ves pa que tu veas. Like, you see, I told you I could go. And I like <laughs> walked off like super haughtily. Like, okay, yeah. But still like trying to like maintain like my dignity and like getting the hell out of there, <laughs> but without having them chase me again. So I was able to hide. Long and the short is I called people in my dad's group. They were able to start a telephone tree with their secret word was called shop at because there was a shop at on a military base, a U.S. military base that they needed to get to. So they all knew that they needed to get their bug out bags, get their families and get the hell to the U.S. military bases. So my grandfather actually picked me up when I was hiding at, at, at my friend's house. And he took me to his home where my grandmother was and my aunt, uncle and cousins were. And so everybody is awake. And by that time, it's like one o'clock in the morning. My mom gets on the phone with my, my grandmother at that point and tells my grandmother, please, you don't understand. Because my grandparents had no idea what my dad was doing. You need to get Kimberly out of there. You need to get her to the U.S. military base now. So eventually, they ended up taking me to the U.S. military base, but not before. We are literally passing the same freaking vehicles that were parked in front of my house are passing us as we are leaving my grandparents' house. So they were coming to pick me up. They knew who my grandfather was, and they were trying to, to get us for, you know, for all intents and purposes, that was their, their goal. But we made it to the U.S. military base. We were there for about three days. And I don't know how detailed you want that information to be, but it was a pretty interesting time how they just moved us around. And at that point, my dad was still in custody of these people. The, they didn't admit to having my dad until four days later. And by that point, we had already escaped, <laughs> escaped the clutches and, and landed in the States, which is, if you want me to tell that story, I think it's actually quite interesting as well. Yeah, yeah, please do. I mean, did you have to fly out in a military transport or something <laughs> like that? I would imagine so. Okay, super cool. So first day we're there, we ended up, we were in the provost marshal's office, you know, starting one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning and starting around six in the morning, they had to, they had to get us out of there because, you know, people were going to start showing up for work and start asking questions. So they got us all into, and by the way, they were at the end, 26 men, women, and children, including my brother my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunt, uncle, and cousins, and then, of course, all the men that were in my dad's group and their families. So 26 of us that I had to actually vouch for, that they put us into different safe houses. And so at this point, nobody is telling us anything. So we're being escorted by military people on, we were at this point on all on Clayton. It was Clayton Army Base. And then I think we went from Clayton to Albrook Air Force Base for a second for our safe houses. We were in these safe houses two days, literally just mattresses on the ground. They gave us MREs. They taped sheets on the windows. They were obviously empty homes of officers' quarters. And we were there three days with MREs and nobody speaking a word to us. Like on the third day, we were taken to, holy moly, we were taken to Albrook Air Force Base hangar where there was a running, there were running helicopters sitting on a golf course. And so at oh first gosh. we didn't see them, but we heard the boom, 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 boom coming. They had us sitting in the seat, the wheel wells of a car, like down so nobody could see us. And then the, the helicopters land, they put us in these helicopters and they take us off to Howard Air Force Base, which is the other side of Panama. From there, we're in a hangar for several hours. There's a C-130 that is literally on, ready to go with the tailgate down. They told us to hold on to one another, heads down, hold on to the guy in front of you. The C-130 is on, ready to go, and we freaking were told to load onto this airplane, which we do. Meanwhile, by the way, I don't have shoes on. I have 
cutoff shorts <laughs> oh my God. And, a, and a cutoff t-shirt. And I'm heading on to the C-130 with no freaking shoes. It was crazy. So, cause I mean, that's how I ran out of my house. You right, know, I, right. I was studying for a test. So literally I left with the clothes on my back and of course my dad's dot matrix printer of, of contacts, which saved the day. We get up onto this airplane, we are in the air, and if I don't know if you've ever been in a C-130, it was really loud, and it was really cold. It, I swear it's hardly pressurized because it's so gigantic. We were sitting in the, the red mesh seats. There was a toilet like behind a curtain, and again, nobody's talking to us. We're like, what the hell? Like We don't know where we're going. We could be taken to Cuba and freaking killed. Like, you know, everybody's <laughs> thinking the craziest things. I'm huddling in the corner with my brother, you know, trying to, he's, he's 11, 12 at the time. So I'm trying to like keep him calm and keep him settled, even though none of us know what's going on. And then from there, we land in the middle of the night. We are not sure where it ended up being a base here in Florida, which is where I, I live in Florida now. Oh gosh. And I'm forgetting the base. I think it was one of the smaller, more secretive bases that the military has here. And they drop us off at the end of a tarmac in the middle of the night. <laughs> and, they, and then the airplane leaves and they just leave us there. We're like, holy shit, what's going to happen? And out of like the grassy fields that are around us, these vehicles, like a Jeep, a van, and like two or three other vehicles like start like pulling up with no headlights on, just pulling up through the grasses. All of a sudden, like a guy with a big giant beard comes out and starts hollering, like, does anybody speak English? <laughs> and the and everybody's like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Like, because we all spoke English. Everybody in our my dad's group is highly educated, educated most of them in the States. And of course, everybody spoke English. And so from that point, we were divvied up into different vehicles. We were stashed in a Howard Johnson for a while. We were on a small airplane for a time, and we went from one place to another place, a U.S. commercial airplane, which was kind of funny because when we were on this commercial plane, at some point they told the special group to get off of the airplane at this point because we had to go somewhere else. And so the special group, meaning everybody in my dad's group. And some random business guy gets off because he's not listening and gets into like the vehicle with us and was like, oh, so you're part of the Panama group. And the guy was like, no. And the guy <laughs> was kicked out of the vans that we were in and he was left on the tarmac of this like Miami International Airport oh or gosh. something. Because <laughs> wow. he was an idiot. He was literally, he's like, oh, wait, we're not going to Cincinnati? And we're like, no, get the hell off. <laughs> And from there, I was able to go to West Palm Beach with my, my brother, and we met up with my mom. Um, and she was in the States, too, unfortunately, caring for her grandmother who was passing away, who was in hospice care of cancer. So my mom was not even there when all of that went down. So I was home alone with my dog when everything happened. Um, and, and my brother was away at a friend's house. So we all collected together, met up with my mom. She was so thankfully relieved to have us because in retrospect, what could have happened had the military actually ca caught up with me would have, would have been awful. I can't even imagine how they could have used me against my dad and, and they didn't get that chance. Thank God. So that was that. <laughs> yeah. what, a, what an evacuation story that is. That's, that's incredible. There. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. Everybody else had their bug out bags and I had my cut off jeans, jean shorts. <laughs> yeah, so, so you left country with absolutely nothing except the clothes on your back and the printout. I mean, you didn't have your passport or anything. I mean, did they have to oh, you know, take care of documents <laughs> for you and that sort of thing afterwards? Yeah, I had literally nothing. My brother had nothing. We were considered, I mean, obviously when we got to the States, the CIA did a lot, a lot of work for us and helped us transition into the States because we had zero documentation. So yes, they were able to get us new data or new our, our new information in the States on their own. Okay. They really, really, truly helped us out. So that being said, like going back to the whole CIA thing, it, it really is important to know that the CIA really got more information from my dad than and his group than they ever gave to my dad, ever. 
And the only thing that they gave to my dad's group was, was cash to pay the monthly rent of the, the different apartment buildings that they had. And they were thankful to get the information that my dad gave them. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet. So they, they gave that money. And did he have a primary contact that whole time? I think there's somebody in the book name or nicknamed ah. Father Frank that he talked yes. about. Yes, yes, yes. Do you remember how I was talking about the transition between the Reagan time to the Bush time? Yes. Okay, so there was a breakdown in communication during the, the Reagan time because my dad didn't feel that they were taking enough safety precautions. Just their operations of security were not very good. So he broke kind of ties with them in that way. Father Frank, literally, so Father Frank came in under the Bush administration and wanted to reestablish connection with my dad and his group and literally gave my dad a phone call <laughs> and said, hello, you know, this is Father Frank pretty much from the CIA. We really need to have a talk. So they meet at a, a, a certain location. You're here because you're fascinated by the Cold War. And now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game for up to four players. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, use your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Penkovsky weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing. Just learn the color codes and point values of each card. My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won two rounds against her mom and I. There's also an expansion edition available for game nights of up to eight players. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15minColdWar.com. And make sure to follow at 15MinuteColdWar on Instagram. They really, I think he needed to, Father Frank needed to plead his case with my dad and be like, listen, we are really going to take care of you in terms of your security. We're not going to, we're just going to be a lot more careful than the previous people were. And so the communication was established again with Father Frank specifically. And so Father Frank was a U.S. based person and he was not a ground, you know, in the grounds in Panama. So it was definitely a lot safer. And so I actually had no idea that that was Father Frank's role because I met Father Frank. He was my first person that I met when I came to the States. And he was the one who facilitated my movement from this secret base that we went to, to the Howard Johnson's that we ended up going to and, you know, safe, the safe house before I was able to meet my mom. And then I'd had conversations with my mom and Father Frank many times during the nine months that my dad was held captive. So he was a, a very important resource for us. Wow. Did he, what's, I don't know if I'd say expectations, but did he meet your expectations? Did he take care of the family in a, in a way that, you know, what was best for all of you, do you think? Or was he having to juggle <laughs> the agency responsibilities plus, you know, caring for, you know, these distraught <laughs> You're such a great question. Yes. And it actually leads to a little bit of a story. He did have to play both sides. I really think that he, he ended up really loving our family. Like he was with us and he was, he was like a grandfather to me almost. He, you know, he was an older guy, had white hair, super white, white skin, pale blue eyes, just to try to give you a description of him. And I literally, every time I saw him, I think he was in a suit, like full blown shirt, tie, jacket, you know, suit. He definitely had to balance between the two. And I say this because of this story. We had a car that we had and my dad, or my, excuse me, my mom had a lot of records in it, stuff that she had sent up from Panama that her friends sent up to her from, from our house in Panama. And at some point, our car happened to be stolen and end up found literally the next day, unharmed, you know, no damage to it, but all of the records that were in the back of my mom's car were stolen. So clearly, I mean, that was an operation where they wanted the documentation that my mom wouldn't give them, but that they took anyway. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> so clearly they were having to, to balance, he was having to balance priorities. 
And I don't even know if that paperwork and documentation held anything important in it or if they got anything from it, but that that's the story as I know it. Quite interesting. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really <laughs> So I, I have to ask at that time, I mean, were you like, were, were you traumatized by all this? Because I, I cannot imagine what a whirlwind that must have been for you to go from studying in your room to seeing your father in prison, you know, and, or, or, you know, detained by the secret police to winding up in Florida with, with nothing. I mean, how, did, what was the effect that it ha- had on you over the next few weeks and months? You know, I was just really thankful to be safe and really worried about my dad, which is such a generic answer, but Excuse me. If you know me, I'm actually much more of an introvert and quite stoic. So I don't feel that I showed so much on the outside in terms of the stress that I was feeling on the inside, but I really I was okay. I truly was okay because I knew I was proud. I was so proud of my dad and what I came to find out later what he had done. Because I know if I had been in the same position and I would have had the opportunities to do something that, that like that, I would have done that. So I was so proud of him. And I was, just, I was just worried about his safety. But I knew that I needed to continue on with my day in and day out life. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't let it get to me. However, that said, of course, I had my moments of, of sadness and and. And I, I wished my mom is a lot like me in that way. I wished my mom would have shown me a little bit of her more emotional side because <laughs> I feel like I needed that on a personal level, like, you know, from my mom. But again, she was like me. She didn't want to show that to me because she wanted to make sure everything was handled and under control, which she is, wow, such an amazing human. And she, she got us through literally the worst of times without my dad, with, with nothing. I mean, we couldn't even get insurance for our cars. And then she was able to figure it out actually with Father Frank. Well, you know, you were USAA because dad was in the military a long time ago and blah, blah, blah. And so things, she handled things, I handled things, but no, I mean, I I guess I'm not like the typical kids nowadays. I feel like that are so soft. (laughs) (laughs) No, I just handled my shit, Justin. I just handled it. (laughs) Wow. So there was a lot to handle. I take it not just what you had been through, but I mean, I, I guess you essentially had to build a new life for yourself because there was no going back to Panama after that yeah. for the foreseeable future. So what did you wind up doing with, you know, during the months of your father's detention? I actually just, we, I had to re-enroll into school and actually I think we were able to get certain documentations and paperwork again through, you know, certain government agencies that were able to help us out to get documentation. So I had to go right back to school I missed maybe, gosh, probably a month. And at that point, it's like middle of the school year. It was really difficult, but my brother and I both got into school. We both went to school. And my mom just, we were living in the Northern Virginia area. So we, my grandmother eventually, or my great-grandmother eventually passed away, unfortunately. So we moved from school where I went to school for about the rest of that year. And then we ended up moving to the Washington, D.C. area, of course, so that my mom could be closer to the politics and to be closer to all the important government agencies that she needed to be in contact with. So then I had to start school again in northern Virginia. In fact, I think I went to Lake Braddock High School in Burke, Virginia, while my mom, I think, started, she she was just on a daily basis at, at the government offices. Mm. Yeah, and trying to and trying to start back her life too, trying to get back into working because she also worked for the Department of Defense Dependent Schools, and of course she was able to get a job there mm-hmm. <laughs> as well. So you know things had a beautiful way of working out. To be completely honest, and you know keep on keeping on. That's how he did it. Yeah, it's it's amazing how you were able to kind of bounce back from all of that. The three of you together. It sounds like you put things together pretty pretty quickly, pretty successfully there. Yeah. We had to, Justin, you know, we had to, and we had to keep it together for my dad. And we're also just kind of that kind of family. We have this little thing in our family. It's cute. It's called, and we always say, even because we would go on these crazy hiking trips and mud trips and, you know, there would always be obstacles and we would always say, muses never think out. And so that was always our saying, muses never think out. If we got stuck in our Land Rover in like 18 feet of mud or in a river at a torrential downpour, muses never think out. 
So that was our motto and it still is. And that was our way of getting through. And so we would say that to ourselves, like when we were having really bad days. Wow. That is incredible. That, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, in that time, we were able to have communication with my dad, actually. Oh, really? We were. So we had really highly censored letters go in and out of the prison cell that he could send out to us that were censored, censored, censored like crazy. He would write letters to my mom in code and say, instead of saying something like, because of course it was being checked by the military police there. And they might not necessarily be the best in English. So, but of course they have the general, you know, sense of it. So my dad would, instead of saying, you know, this would be, it, it feels like the heat of summer here in Panama. He would, he would say it, it feels like the heat of Sumter, you know, cause Fort Sumter, the battle of Fort Sumter was a heated battle. And so, and that would like things like that, that hmm. were like, like, he would constantly give out clues based on like his, cause my dad is a huge military history buff. And so he would use his military history buff knowledge to kind of give clues to my mom and give clues to the U S military. That was also reading the documentation that went through from my dad. And my dad was able to actually sneak out some letters that were uncensored through bindings of books that he was able to give to his American doctor who was his name, Dr. Ruffer, who is an amazing human, a doctor and a Marine, and he was in the army, just an amazing human, whose daughter was actually one of my great friends in high school. It's really weird, all the connections that people have in this world. It's, it's just amazing, the connectivity and the connections that we have in this world without even knowing it. So my, and my dad and this doctor had this amazing connection where if my dad's heart rate was up, the doctor would know that there was something going on and he would ask him slightly more pressing questions or would ask for like a little more time with him. So they had their certain ways of communicating, which were not caught by the, the, the guardia that was there. Mm -hmm. And by the way, my dad at his door at the, the Carcel Modelo, which was the prison he was being held in solitary confinement, had an executioner outside of his door, whose number one task was literally to kill my dad if anything was to go down. So, you know, it was a little scary. My dad would talk to his executioner like, oh, so would you really kill me? And the man was like, yes, I will. Wow. And so he, he lived with that for nine months. I, he, he's such a strong man. And he did some really just funny things in, in prison to entertain himself. <laughs> it just shows you that the determination of my dad to get through and to come back in one piece to see his family. So he would like, just a, a, a example, he would take like toilet paper rolls out of the toilet paper. And there was, you know, people monitoring him from the outside from across the street was a, a comandancia, which is like the, the head of the military. And so from the comandancia, they could look into his cell. So he would pretend with these two toilet paper rolls that he had binoculars and then sure enough, like an hour later, 30 minutes later, the guard would like come up to his door and like be, oh my gosh, we, do you have binoculars? Like, what do you have? Like, come check his room and like freak out. And he like, he would, he would tuck it back in the toilet paper. So we, they would have no clue where he would get these binoculars from, which weren't actually binoculars. But he would do stuff like that to mess with them all the time. It was hilarious. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. What a yeah. resilient guy too. <laughs> Super funny. He would do his like, Exercise running like 50, 50 direction, you know, fi run 50, 50 laps, one direction, 50 laps, another direction, do push ups, do his sit ups. Like he calls it the carcel modelo diet plan because <laughs> he, he's, he's a big dude. My dad is like six foot two, easily, I would say probably 250, like a big solid football player kind of a guy. And when he got out, he's probably closer to like 200. And oh that, that, he looked like, I mean, for, uh, I mean, it's still a big dude, but for him, he was like freaking emaciated, mm. just not his normal self. So it was, it was, it was not easy for him. And they, they did not touch him physically, but they certainly did a lot of, of mental torture tactics with him, pretending they were going to shoot his brains out. And he was like, you know what? I don't think they are because 
I'm right now sitting in front of a filing cabinet, the filing cabinet is open, that would get blood all over their files. So <laughs> definitely, like literally this was his mindset. Wow. And he was like, okay. And he, he couldn't get caught up in lies. So we had to make everything as, mo as, as most as he can based in truth and try to remember the lies that he would make at least to gain himself time for myself to get out. This was, you know, in the early days and for his people to get out. So they wouldn't know like who they had and who he was until later. And so eventually it did all come out. I think once he realized that everybody was safe. And so he told them where the apartments were and had, you know, told them the, where the equipment was. And he ended up going on television because like, you know, Nordiega was like, look, we caught public enemy number one, this horrible American. He's probably CIA, so which he wasn't. But, you know, of course, he doesn't mind it because CIA really did help us. So I'm not saying that he doesn't. He, he's like anti-CIA. He's definitely not because obviously, like, we have so much family history with them. But disclaimer, he was not and did everything organically with his group of friends. But, of course, Noriega tried to put it to the side of this. Oh, look, look at, you know, the CIA operative. We caught him sort of a thing. So yeah, yeah I can I can imagine. So <laughs> did they primarily want to learn from him, you know, the the rest of the network, you know, the identities of everyone else who had, who were able to escape or or did they have yes. other information that they wanted from him as well? I think they wanted to know the rest of the other seditious people in his gang, which he never gave up ever ever ever, mm -hmm. but he did he never would give that up, but he did give them where the apartment was. And I think he actually probably said that it was all of his own doing and probably, you know, said that it, what, excuse me, was just him doing all of this to, to kind of take the attention off of anybody else that might've been in his group. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And then it, everybody, it is. you said 26, 26 people got out. Was that including you and your brother? It uh, was, it wow. was, yes. Okay. Including, yes, all of us together in that cold C-130. <laughs> yeah. Wow, hard to imagine. Yeah, it, so it I, is. I it actually that, feels surreal. I, I bet, I bet. I, I know that your father was held for about nine months altogether. Is that right? That is that is absolutely correct, yes. So, so that, you know, it culminated in this incredibly dramatic rescue and this invasion of Panama as well, which I want to talk about, of course, but yes. did you have any inkling that any of that was going to happen? Was there, you know, big things are in the work or your dad's coming home next month or anything like that? Or were you totally in the dark, your family in the dark about all of this? Um, so a couple of stories with that. First, so the October before his rescue, his rescue was in December. There was actually a big coup and it was started by some military uh, that was against Noriega and it was, ended up being very unsuccessful. And they ended up shooting and killing these people in front of my dad. Like, again, to continue with the torture, the mental side of things for my dad. It was absolutely horrible. Yes. So, so things kind of were ramping up. So to set the stage, things were ramping up. We felt something was going to happen. The violence was really escalating in Panama. My mom, at some point, I found out, you know, later... She said that she had an interview with Father Frank and Father Frank was and some other officials at, at the Pentagon. And they asked my mom, so do you think Kurt would sign this letter saying that he's sorry, saying, you know, that he, you know, apologizes and that he, you know, didn't mean to do this. And my mom looked at them and was like, are you kidding? He would <laughs> never do that. He would never, ever do that. Like, he is so principled and so moral. He, no, he would never do that. And they were like, right answer. Good job, Annie. That's my mom's <laughs> name. And so they never said anything after that. But apparently that was when, and I'm not sure exactly where in the timeline this was. I'm assuming it was probably closer, closer around to when the, the coup happened and things were escalating. And that was the time when... I think Delta Force was given the go-ahead and they started the mock-up. They did a, a mock-up prison cell of the Carcel Modelo, like a whole mock-up of the building. And they started their plans on rescuing my dad without any of our knowledge. So no, in fact, we had zero knowledge that this was going to happen. But in retrospect, some of the things leading up to it, some of the questions that they asked us, of course, now we know why. They just wanted to make sure of our fortitude and my dad's fortitude that he could make it through a rescue, which hell yeah, he can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think a lot of listeners are probably somewhat familiar with this story, at least, but can you talk about how the actual rescue occurred? I know it was just as, as dramatic as anything could possibly be, honestly. Oh my gosh. It, it's, I, I just don't understand how this is not a movie yet. It is freaking, it is movie quality, this stuff, but it's actual real life what happens. So on December 19th, there was a, an incident involving the, Mex the, sorry, the Panamanian police and a U.S. military guy named Lieutenant Bus. And it's so ironic that his name, or, or meant to be, his name was Lieutenant Bus, meaning peace. He and his wife were stopped at a, at a military barricade by the military police. The husband was shot and killed, but not before he saw his wife being brutally raped and then ultimately also murdered. So because of that incident, that was pretty much the trigger point for Operation Just Cause to actually start in that moment because Delta Force was ready. They were ready to go. They were ready for the word. December 20th, which is when the invasion was, the first operation of Operation Just Cause, again, remember, there's an executioner at my dad's door. The first operation was to rescue my dad in Operation Acid Gambit. So what they did is they blew up the Comandancia as a distraction. They landed the helicopter. It's the, the little bird on top of the Comandancia, uh, or on top of the Carcel Modelo. They neutralized, you know what I mean, the certain people that were in the way. They get to my dad's prison cell after landing on the top of the roof of Carcel Modelo, and they say, Moose, get down. We're blowing the door. And so, boom, they blow the door. My dad is hiding behind his his cot, he is awake and fully ready to go. Like mm. clothes on, ready to go. He knew shit was hitting the fan, so he was ready. They blow the door. They quickly get him upstairs, like the one and a half, you know, steps, the one and a half like flight of stairs. You know, along the way, he sees the people that were neutralized that were literally going to kill him. They get into the helicopter. They hand my dad a, before the helicopter, they hand my dad a helmet, which he didn't secure to his head. He didn't click it, and that's important, and I'll tell you in a second why. And they, he put, they put, you know, Kevlar vest on him, of course, to prevent, you know, to, to protect him. They get in the airplane. It, they take off. Things are going great. And so from landing to take off, that was the six minutes to freedom. However, after that six minutes, their helicopter is literally shot down within the giant prison walls. It skids a couple of times, and this amazing pilot was able to bump it up and get over the wall again, get some altitude, but then they are shot down again. And this time, they actually crash from somewhat of a distance, and the bird lands on its side, and the rotor blades are going. Everybody's, like, getting out. There was one guy whose foot was crushed. A really dear friend, ended up being a really dear friend of my dad's and of my family's. His foot was crushed. They were able to get him out and out of that situation. And he was still he is so aware and able to do his job. However, in front of my dad, the guy who was, he was holding on to was hit in the head with a rotor blade. My dad was literally woo, like a foot behind him. And his helmet fell off during the crash because he didn't secure it. If my dad had been in front, he would have he would have been decapitated. Oh my gosh. So the guy who got hit in the rotor blade was knocked out. My dad, thinking he was shot, laid down beside him and is and is like with him, talking to him. Eventually the guy comes to and is like, Kurt, are you okay? And my dad is like, Are you fucking kidding me? Are you okay? And he goes like, Yeah, I just knocked out. And so and I, I don't know if it was him or somebody else. They're like, my dad was like, give me a handgun, give me a handgun. So they gave my dad a pistol and like they were, they were off and they were, you know, maintaining, they, they were together, all of them, every, nobody else was, there were some people that was actually, one guy was shot, shot through the shoulder, but again, he was okay. Obviously really injured though. Like you, you can see there's some pictures in the book of some of the injuries that were sustained, but they all lived these amazing American heroes all, oh my gosh, it like, makes me cry. I'm so sorry. These heroes just, wow, they gave their, they were so willing to give their lives for my dad. 
my dad and our family is like so, so indebted to them. And yet they come back and they say, wow, it is such an honor to know you and to have rescued you, like everything that you went through. It, it, it's just, it's like this mutual admiration club. So anyway, sorry, I digress. They ended up getting to a safe spot. They were, there was a Spectre gunship that they were in contact with in their comms that was circling around, keeping them safe. They eventually got to a really good safe spot. And th- my dad was able to like keep everybody cool and calm in a, not, no, they were cool and calm, but there were like some military, there were some Panamanian civilians who freaking had no idea what was going on. And they were just trying to like get close to see what was going on. And literally everybody was like ready to like shoot them. And my dad was like, no, 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 wait. And he was like telling the Panamanian guys, oye, oye, por favor, lárgate, métete a tu casa, por favor, like get away, go into your house for safety. This is not a safe spot. And so the guy literally hightailed it and the other two people like, and got back into the, into their building. And so where they were is not a very nice area. It's like a, like a, like a favela for all intents and purposes. So not a good area. So there's definitely a lot of people around. There could have been a lot of casualties, but everybody kept a level head. Nobody else was harmed. And a few minutes later, a freaking tank rolled up. They all got in. They all went to Balboa High School, which is where the triage was for all the wounded personnel. They separated my dad from the Delta Force guys. And my dad was like, oh, hell no. Hell no. Like, I need to talk to these guys. Like, I need to talk to these guys. I need to thank him. And my dad got clearance from, at that time, Commander Bargewell to go in and talk to the guys. And Bargewell was like talking to my dad, like, oh my God, like amazing. And you know, Bargewell ended up being w- literally one of the most decorated generals of all time. But the connection that my dad made with the general or the commander at the time was amazing. And I know that was one of your next questions, if he still keeps in touch with his guys. And holy moly, 100% he does. He keeps in touch with the, the, the old guys who rescued him, the guys in between, and the guys now. There is an amazing bond and connection that is absolutely undes- indescribable. Wow. Indescribable. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. After all these years, that bond is still there, huh? Oh, my God. It's, it's, there's, it's, it's definitely still there. My dad, in fact, to his guys on the rescue mission, he gives them each individually a call every single year on December 20th, thanking them for saving him. Wow. Literally. For, I mean, so it's been over 20 years. Every hmm. year for the past, you know, 25 years, he calls each one of them individually to thank them for saving him. And holy moly, these guys are seriously brother in arms, brothers in arms. Absolutely amazing. And they really do treat us like family. That's wonderful. That's, that's really good to hear. That's got to be <laughs> yeah. very cathartic for them as well, knowing that, you know, what they went through had such lasting repercussions for the people that they yes. saved, you know, the people that were impacted by their, by their operations as well, that their, you know, the risks that they took mattered. It, 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 yes. Oh my gosh. It mattered so much to this one little family. And I just, I, I, I can't believe that they, they did it just, you know, just for us, you know, it's what it feels like. Like, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't even feel worthy of it. And yet these, these amazing individuals are like, wow, well, we're honored to save you. I'm like, are you kidding me? You guys are the guys doing all of this hard work and literally putting your lives on the line. So there is like this debt of gratitude that will never be paid off. But, you know, we really try to show them that gratitude. Like, it's, you know, every time we go to Fort Bragg to my dad does talks all the time with, you know, with the 160th, with the 180th, like he, he is constantly doing talks to let them know that what they are doing makes a difference. And as you know, like within this, this political climate that we're in now, it, I don't think that they're feeling the appreciation and the love that they should be feeling right mm. now. I see. Yeah. I understand that completely. Ooh, so Kim, I, do, I do have one question about the rescue that was really on my mind there. The guy yes. outside of a cell who was supposed to shoot him at the first sign of anything going wrong, why didn't he shoot? Was he the first guy himself that got shot or did he yeah. you know, get cold feet or what? 
No, he was the first guy that got neutralized. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, he, he, it was a very, very tactical operation. And as the Comandancia is exploding, he's being shot. Oh my gosh. Yes. So it was, it was it's just an inc- incredibly well-run tactical mission. And my dad at that time was the only American hostage ever successfully rescued by Delta Force mm. at that time. There have been more since then. And that the unit does does some really special things. So yes, the, the execution the executioner was executed. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's some precision timing to, to time it yeah, with yes. the building blowing up down the street. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, there it is. My gosh. So how how did you first learn that your dad was safe after all this went down? Good question. So, you know, there had been so many I feel like false advertisements, like we thought in, during the coup that like something might happen. We thought there were lots of emotional times with up and downs. And so I'm like, oh, mom, whatever, nothing's going to happen. Like, just leave me alone. I'm, I'm going back to sleep. And she woke me up and she's like, no, Kimberly, it's, I'm getting too many calls. This is happening. Something's happening. And so we woke up and we were just glued to the television, glued to the phone, trying to figure out what was going on, what was happening we didn't really get word that he was physically safe until the next day. And the next day they said to my mom, Annie, I'm sorry, it's going to be like another two or three days before we get into you. And my mom was like, are you freaking kidding me? I've waited <laughs> nine months. I don't care. Oh my God. Like this is, this is the best gift you could give us. And so my dad was delivered to us on December 23rd, two days before Christmas in the middle of some private airport and it started snowing literally right when we got out of the airplane and we all ran out and hugged him and cried and didn't even say a word as the snow is falling around us. Like it's this amazing visual that I have with like this airplane just sitting there, like this little airplane and nobody else. Like I don't remember seeing anybody else. It was just the most bizarre situation. Everything was surreal. So surreal. Hmm. I, yeah, so. it's hard for me to imagine. <laughs> how, how did he look? You said that he had lost a lot of weight, but I mean, did he look, you know, s- stronger than you expected or, or weaker or, or what? He looked exhausted. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all I can say. He, he looked like himself, but he definitely, he looked really tired and just, just so grateful to be home. So grateful to have us in his arms. And I never see my dad cry, and he was crying there. Hmm. It was it was a very powerful, it was a very powerful moment. I'll bet, I'll bet. How did the family like in the in the weeks and the months to come? How did you all kind of put the pieces back together? Because your lives are very different now than they were the last time you had all been together before that, right? I yeah. mean, was it, was it difficult? You sound like a tough, resilient family to begin with, and I'm sure that helped. <laughs> yeah, it does. So, you know, a lot of times, like, I'm going to draw the parallel, although it's not the same, but a small parallel of when, you know, military people go and are in combat and see things and they come back and they try to reintegrate into normal family life. And so for us being the receiver, it's it's a, a lot easier, but I could see for him it was a lot more difficult. You know, he, he didn't know necessarily what to do with himself. And it was a little, he was definitely jumpy. And I, I say that because like, just for instance, like I remember, like I, I found him napping and I'd come home after school and he looked so peaceful and gentle. Like I, I went up and, and I quietly kissed him on the forehead <laughs> he like literally almost killed me. Oh my gosh. Cause he was like, like, like there's still like that fight or flight response. And that was so deeply embedded in him. And, and I didn't even think about it. You know, I'm like this, you know, naive high school girl. And I'm like, shit, of course I should have thought about Mm. scaring the hell out of him as he's napping, you know, tranquilly in his home, but like startling him is not the right thing to do. And he was, oh my God, I think he almost literally cried that he was so apologetic afterwards. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I was, I was, I felt so horrible. Like I felt so sad that he felt that on the inside. But as you said, and as I have said, he's a very tough man. And he, you know, everybody asks, you know, did you get any like psychologists or this or that? Like, did you even get 
we didn't even get debriefed. It took them like <laughs> like a year and a half to, to debrief wow. my dad after everything. Like, I don't know wh- why it took so long. Hmm. But yeah, it took like a year and a half for him to get debriefed. It was bizarre. And he just somehow found his way and, you know, threw himself into, okay, you know, I can't go back to Panama right now. What do I know? I am in printing and graphics. So he started a franchise of, you know, Insti Prints and tried to get back into his family business. And he did that for so many years. It just, you know, wasn't necessarily his thing after, after the intensity that he had before. Yeah, um, yeah, I can, I can see yeah. that it, it kind of lost his luster a little bit after everything that happened. It, it totally did. And he ended up, you know, retiring early. And my mom was the one, you know, keeping the family together. She is just the strongest woman. But my dad ended up going on you know, doing consulting and starting several smaller companies with actually some of his Delta Force former rescuers. Wow, really? Uh-huh, he did. Developing military cameras and data gathering. And unfortunately they didn't win some of the contracts and, you know, my dad invested so much time and so much money. And so did some of his compatriots that actually worked with him and rescued him. And unfortunately some of these things didn't work out because usually the bigger contractors went out, unfortunately. So he's, he's done a lot of different things and still just in tune with his love and his passion, which was, you know, American freedom and liberty. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Very principled guy. Did any of you ever go back to Panama for any stretch of time after all of this? We definitely did. It probably took about six years later and we went together as a family and we were all on edge a little bit because you never know who still remains there. You know, the, the bad guys and there's obviously still people and you know, the, the, party that was quote unquote supporting Noriega and you know you just shouldn't be stupid and unwise and so he was he was definitely more on edge and it's definitely not a place he's ever going to go back to live just because it's there's just so much insecurity and I think it's just bad for his health (laughs) you know with that Mm -hmm. much peripheral anxiety so we went there and honestly I feel because of everything that transpired you know we he goes back and sees his friends but we will never live there again. And our home is definitely in the United States of America at this point. Mm, good to hear. Good to hear. For my, for my, for my parents, at least. <laughs> I like to move around a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can tell that. I can tell that from what I've seen so far. So how do yes. you think, just you personally, how do you think that all of this kind of shaped you? Because that happened at a very you know, formative time in your life, of course. I mean, has it drastically changed who you, who you would have been otherwise? Oh, wow. Yeah, I would say it was extremely formative. I had to grow up. I I think I was mature for my age anyway, but holy moly, I had to, I had to grow up instantly, immediately. And, and there was no time for fun and play. And it was just, you know, pretty much everything was serious, life and death. And, and it, definitely formed my character even more so maybe fortified what my dad had already given me and and made it just more imprinted on my who I am this resiliency of wanting to be positive and principled but always you know keeping an eye on being present and enjoying what's around you but again no time for like the stupid silly petty stuff you know everything is you know you know take time and enjoy it life but don't, don't, you know, don't be stuck on all this stupid, petty stuff. You know, <laughs> life, life is important and, and to appreciate things and, and you know, appreciate the people around you, not the things that are with you. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can certainly say that was probably the best possible lesson that you could have taken. Of, <laughs> yes. all of that. And I just have one question. It's kind of a, maybe even a minor detail really, but since you said the thing, you know, caring about the people and not the things, did your family, did you lose like everything from Panama? Like all of your you know, household goods, all of that, was it completely, you know, gone? Was it not recoverable, you know, once you left the country? Pretty much everything of value was stolen. All of our vehicles, well, I mean, we, I think we two or three vehicles. The vehicles were stolen. The jewelry that my mom had from her grandmother and my grandmother, like all of our jewelry was stolen. Pretty much anything of value was stolen. We were able to get 
some furniture. S- somehow my mom had friends, you know, from her schooling days and they were able to pack up our house and we were able to ship it all back up to the oh, States. Okay. Just some of our household goods, not a lot, but definitely some things that, that reminded us of home that made our home in the States more comfortable and felt like more like our home in Panama. So that was absolutely wonderful that we were able to get some of our things back, but definitely not the majority. Yeah. Definitely okay. not. I'm glad you recovered some things. I mean, like you said, they yeah. are just things, but I mean, they, they, they are. you're connected to them <laughs> in a way. So that's good that you didn't lose absolutely everything. I exactly. Guess. Exactly. No, it, it was good. Although honestly, I, I could not have cared less because my true gift was getting my dad back mm, safely. Certainly. And holy moly, that really gave me so much. Like I, I, you know, I was faithful and spiritual before, but that really fortified my my faith. Like, uh, let me tell you just a little story, uh, kind of about that. So, when we were in in Florida before I even moved to the states, I didn't know if it was President Bush was new in in you know the presidency, and I didn't know if he knew the situation of my dad. So I was praying to God. I was like, God what do I need to do? Should I write President Bush a letter? And I was like, God, if you really want me to write this letter, you will give me a sign. And the sign is going to be thunder and lightning. And I am not joking you, Justin, literally it thundered and lightnings. And I was like, oh my God, I got to get out of bed. It was like midnight. (laughs) And I, from the heart, started writing this long letter to President Bush and to his wife that did get to him. And he responded in kind, and it was the most, I still have it. And I think copies of both letters are in my dad's book, so you can see them. But they were truly, I I feel like God willing, and truly I felt like my prayers were answered when, you know, all his rescuers came back safely, albeit some injured, and that my dad came back alive. Mm. So, a lot of... A lot of, lot of spirituality there, for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I certainly see that. Oh. Your family did end up meeting President Bush after that, right? I've seen a photo. Yeah, we did. I was so happy because it was right after I got my braces off. <laughs> 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 and it was like big hair days. So if you happen to see the picture, you'll see the big hair. I did I did um, notice that, yes. <laughs> Don't laugh. And then it, it was spectacular. I think uh, Strom Thurmond was there. President Bush was there. Barbara Bush was there. We met several other dignitaries who, to be honest with you, I couldn't even tell you who they were, but you know, they were some important people. Got to eat in the Oval Office. We got to eat in some special restaurant that they had there, like a, a, a special place. And let me tell you, President Bush was the most kind and gracious and personable person, one of the persons I've ever met. And to, and to think that he's president of the greatest country on earth was, is spectacular. He just made us feel like we were literally at home and looked us in the eyes and was talking to us like he meant it and, and shook our hands with these big, giant, warm hands. He was a very tall man, like taller than my dad. And my dad is tall. It was absolutely wonderful meeting him, and it was a really, really cool experience to be in the Oval Office with him. Oh, gosh. I bet. I bet. It's hard for me to imagine, but that sounds wonderful. (laughs) And you're all smiles in the photo. I do remember that. Yeah, oh, for sure. (laughs) Freaking ear to ear. (laughs) Fantastic. So you you talked about your dad. What what did you do after that? Like, what did you end up, you know, growing up to do or to be? I ended up going to work. So I studied biology, ended up working for a large pharmaceutical company for 15 years. And then once I had my third child, decided it was time to resign and take care of my three children because it was so stressful taking care (laughs) of three kids and having a job. And my husband had a a fabulous job where we were both traveling a lot. So I decided to stay at home and it was really the best decision of my life to do that because ultimately my youngest son ended up passing away of of a very rare disease, somewhat like a leukemia. And I am just so thankful that I was able to spend 100% of my time with him. So again, I feel like things happen for a reason. And I don't know why the reason is that he passed away, but I do know I know why I stopped working is so that I could spend every last second with him. Hmm. So that oh was gosh. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's a wonderful perspective to have on that. It's hard for me to imagine going through something like that, but you, you seem like you constantly seek out the, <laughs> the positive in any situation. That's kind of been a theme through this whole interview. Honestly, yes, so. sir. I, I do try. And I, I did end up raising like 
$250,000 with a charity that I founded in his name for research for this disease that he had and for other children's charities in my community. So yeah, definitely my dad's experience gave me the resilience and the fortitude to continue on and and to try to seek the positive things and to continue moving forward no matter how how hard life may be. Just moving forward is the is the answer, the mm. key. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Yeah. Very impressive, honestly. Thank you. Kim, I know that your your dad wrote the book Six Minutes to Freedom, like we've we've talked about already, of course. Are there any other projects in the work for this? The book is, you know, what, 15, 15 years ago it was published, I think, something like that? Yes, yes, sir. I think it was about 15 years ago. And to be honest, it's a bit frustrating because, yes, there are rights out there for the book. They have written two sets of actual scripts for it that are somewhere out there. I don't think that things have actually just landed together in terms of funding, in terms of actors, in terms of actual conceptualizing ideas on how to move it forward. Because first they were thinking build silver screen movie, and then they were thinking now with the trends of, you know, after COVID, that maybe more of a Netflix Hulu type series might happen. So it's still something that could happen. But there's definitely nothing concrete right now. But there, there are the rights are out there right now waiting to be, I think, picked up by somebody. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think somebody's got a hit on their hands if they treat it right, because this story really does have everything. I really think it does, too. I really do. Gosh. Well, well, this get is amazing. Get us in contact with somebody, Justin. Get yeah. us in contact with somebody. Yeah. I, uh, I'd like to say I know people, but I, I don't think <laughs> Maybe maybe I've got some followers out there that could help out with that kind of thing, but they haven't revealed themselves to me yet. So maybe after this episode debuts, who knows? The world works in mysterious ways. It you never is. know. Definitely. So, and if it does make it onto the big screen, I'll certainly be there on the opening day. I'm very excited about the possibility of that, even if it's years in the future. Me too. Me too. Most definitely. Wow. So Kim, this has been a wonderful talk. I, other than the book, is there a, a way for people to learn more about you or anything? Do you have like a public facing social media pages or, or anything like that? Or does your father? Oh, no. My dad does not have anything public, although they could try to find him. He is on Instagram. Or, oh, no, sorry. He's on Facebook. So they could probably find him under his name, Kurt Muse. And he may or may not accept. I'm not sure how he is. I think it is a private profile, but they could try. And I do have a public profile that I started actually <laughs> for my dog, but it does have some of my personal stuff in it. I have a really cool, I'd have to say badass Belgian Malinois. And so he has his own page and it's called K9 Odin, the Mal. <laughs> Them out. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll link yep. it up so people can click on it easily instead of having to write it down or something like that. Perfect. Yeah. Right. And so it's just, I do travel a lot. We were in, he was our, our protection dog in Mexico when I lived there for five years. He was originally like a, apparently originally trained EOD specialist and then was transferred over to being a, a working dog for our family, which is absolutely amazing in Mexico. So my husband and I and our children. So <laughs> Kim, I can already is. tell you have a whole nother set of stories that you haven't revealed <laughs> at all. So I don't think we have time for that today, but uh, no, maybe, sir. <laughs> uh, maybe when I write my book, just kidding. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, good. Well, I know how to find you anyway. I found you once. So yes, yes, you did. Yes, you did. Wonderful. All right. So uh, we'll link up that account if people want to find you there. Um, yeah, I'm already following you, so it's not hard to find at all. No, it is exactly. a beautiful dog. Certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I, I look forward to staying in touch with you. And I really thank you so much for this interview, Justin. It's cool how I found you, actually. Because remember, I contacted you. I know. I know. Originally. So my jujitsu instructor was like, hey, I saw this story about this Kurt Muse, this guy in Panama. Like, is this you and your dad? And I was like, oh, my God, yes. So remember, and I reached out to you. And I was like, hey, that's my dad you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And that started this whole thing. <laughs> it, did, it did. And I tell you, you know, when you contacted me, I kept going back and forth between your profile picture and the picture with President Bush. Like, is yeah. that her? I couldn't tell because <laughs> you had a private account and I couldn't zoom yeah. in. I was like, is this another scam? Because I get a lot of scammers, but it wasn't. It was no you. way. Oh no, it's totally me. <laughs> it is. I know that now. Here we are. 
here we are. <laughs> yeah, that was very that was very sep- serendipitous. I have to admit, it's extremely rare that I can find somebody currently online that lived through you know the kind of stories that I like to share. And you know, you're a lot yes. younger than many of my guests. I have guys who are 60s, 70s, 80s. That'll you know, and they're not you know necessarily on social media Ex- all the time. But here we are. Exactly. Again, serendipitous and mysterious ways of the world. I gotta say, it's. We're all connected somehow. <laughs> yep, we certainly are, and here we are. Well, thank you, Kim. This has been this has been wonderful. I know that people are going to love this episode once they hear it in a couple of weeks. So I will stay in touch with you for sure after this, and thank you once again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode and want to read Kurt Muse's book Six Minutes to Freedom, I'll send you a PDF of the book's preface and first chapter completely for free. Just follow the link in the show notes to get your own copy and dive into this story in even more depth. And if you're interested in more Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram, at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.